Hi, everyone. I'm Andy Bernstein, the host of the Legends of Sport podcast. All of us at Legends of Sport are thrilled to bring this classic episode to you with the logo himself, the legendary Jerry West. My chat with Jerry during the summer of 2020 was truly one of my favorite interviews. We touched on so many deep and important topics. I had just finished reading Jerry's autobiography, West by West, My Charm Tormented Life. Jerry was forthcoming and candid about the mental health struggles he's endured since childhood and about his ultra competitive drive. We talked about the social justice issues that were front and center in the summer of 2020, just as they were when Jerry played in the 60s. We also discussed what Jerry saw in a brash, super athletic high school kid named Kobe Bryant that convinced him to trade for him at the 1996 NBA draft and his deep relationship with the Mamba throughout his iconic career. Just when most people his age are headed to retirement and the golf course and being a grandpa, Jerry took a job working for Steve Ballmer in the Clippers. Jerry is truly an inspiration and a cherished friend. I hope you enjoy this classic Legends of Sport episode with the great Jerry West. And as always, I'll see you on the backside. So welcome, Jerry West, to the Legends of Sport podcast. Um, such an honor for me to have you as a guest, my friend. First off, I just I just want to get this out of the way. I want to thank Chris Wallace of the Clippers and especially your wife, Karen, for setting this up today. You know, in these, this, these days of publicists and social media managers and agents, you know, to just call Karen and she sets it up. But there's Jerry. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> well, you're welcome. Thank you. Well, you're looking good, man. How how are you guys doing? Well, I think everything is uh, <clears throat> probably the same for most people. Uh, you know, you're trying to stay safe and, uh, you know, away from any potential uh, <clears throat> contact with people that uh, it's not necessary, to be honest with you. But uh, uh, frankly, it's pretty boring. Uh, you know, I mm -hmm. sit around and wonder, you know, I need to do something. I just can't be cooped up. I, it's been, my life has been to kind of roam a little bit when I was a kid, you know, all out in the woods all the time, exploring things. And <clears throat> as an adult, uh, uh, the many interests that I've had in my life, <clears throat> uh, the one about the only one that I can really pursue now is reading <clears throat> because I like to read a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think when you read 60, 70, maybe 80 books in this period of time, you get to the point that some books you start them, they have no interest to, uh, to you and you, move on to another one, try to find something that will at least keep your attention. But uh, mm -hmm. it's difficult. Uh, uh, the one thing I find is that if I can see something that's competitive, and I'm talking about in the sports field, then certainly I would watch that. And now we have basketball back, a lot of content. Mm -hmm. And so that passes the day a lot. But um, mm -hmm. as I say, it is frustrating for me, and I'm sure a lot of other people. Well, that, I, I, I got to ask you, Jerry, I mean, because I know I've known you for a long time and even <clears> in the best of times in a full arena, you can't sit still and watch a game. I mean, how, how are you dealing with um, not being able to go to a live game? I mean, you're sitting at home watching it in your easy chair or on your couch. It's got to be eaten away at you. Well, you know, I think there's, even as a player, <clears throat> there is an anticipation of uh, the game. Okay. You had a, you had a, a, at least me, I had a plan, okay? Mm -hmm. I did the same thing in my life as a player <clears throat> for 14 years as a professional. Mm -hmm. In college, uh, you could only play uh, for three years, we, even though we had a JV team. Mm -hmm. So I had a routine that I followed, and if I didn't follow it, I felt like I was cheating myself or even cheating the game. Right. And so <clears throat> now it's a little bit easier for me in terms of, uh, going to a game, there's something about the crowd. And even though the NBA has done an unbelievable job of not only keeping players safe and providing competition, but it doesn't see, seem the same uh, internally with me. Mm -hmm. uh, I just know, knew that the uh, game days were special to me. <clears throat> I did the same thing in my life for 14 years as a professional player. I drew, drove to the game same way uh, had the same meal for 14 years in my life before a game and then come back <clears throat> at night and not be able to go to sleep and replay the game over and 
yeah. get ready to play the next day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so are you, are you, I mean, obviously you're, you must be in touch with the Clippers organization. How are you um, contributing being here and there, there? How does that work? Well, Andrew, you know, my job is, as a consultant, sometimes it gets overblown. I, you know, I do have a voice and, uh, but we have a lot of voices over there. Um, I'm really blessed to be with some people that I like a lot. And uh, the owners, uh, Steve Baum, were just a fantastic person. And in terms of uh, if people only knew him personally, they would find a uniquely different person. Mm -hmm. uh, he and his wife, Connie, are, are incredible givers uh, to causes that no one knows about. Mm -hmm. And to see a man who's been so successful uh, have other ways in his life that he can contribute to society and make this a better place, it's really heartwarming when you know the whole story. And he, he and his wife, both Connie, they both um, shy away from that. But uh, he is, he's a unique man. And, and I wish we had more people, you know, not as owners, of course, but that had the caring that he does for the, for the causes in America and try to make this a better world to live in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, um, I love seeing the two of you confer during the game. You sit right behind me where I sit on the court, you know, which is really fun. And you I love can't it. do that anymore. I was getting ready to say this is no, a, no. I, I said, <laughs> what is this man doing on this talking on a on a podcast? <laughs> I'm just trying to stay relevant, Jerry, but uh, <laughs> just, you know, try to eke out a living at the best I can here. Um, but I've been doing this podcast for three years, which is great, and it sort of you know supplements me during the day when I got to work at night. But I'm headed to the bubble in a couple of weeks, so who knows what's in store for me when I get down there? But um, God willing, we will see um, the Clippers advancing, and who knows? You know, I don't want to jinx it, but you know, we could see two teams that play in the same city in a conference final. I don't want to say what city or the or the names of the teams, you know, but. <laughs> That would be unbelievable. Well, that would be, I think that would be great. Honestly, I really yeah. do. I think it'd make the city come alive. Obviously, the Lakers' history has been there forever, and you know my many years there were filled with a lot of joy, a lot of sadness when you don't win all the time. But mm. uh, yeah, and working with some great people. You know, I'm working. I'm not working. I'm involved. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, you know, if you find someone something you love to do, Andrew, you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah. And uh, I've never worked a day in my life. And uh, yeah. If I feel like I'm not viable, then I just back up and leave. That's yeah. that's the way I've always been in my life. I follow my own feelings. Uh, and uh, so I've been fortunate to be involved with some really great people in this league. Yeah. So, Jerry, um, you know, you, you struggled and suffered six times losing to the Celtics, right? And when I get when I started shooting at the forum and uh, I was told, don't ever wear green in this building. <laughs> that was told to me like straight out, <laughs> right? And you have made it abundantly clear in your book and elsewhere that you don't even like the city of Boston. You don't want to go to the city of Boston. You know, of course, you have a love for Bill Russell and, and all that. But is this still lingering, Jerry? Do you, are you still holding on to this stuff? No, not really, Andrew. <clears throat> I've said it more than once. Uh, you know, I have nothing but respect for those guys um, and the people I played with. And you mentioned Bill Russell. I just talked to him yesterday, I think, mm -hmm. on the phone. And so we we still communicate. And uh, obviously, as someone I forget sports, uh, someone I like personally. And it's nice to still hear him um, uh, speaking and as other people that I communicate with in the league and rivals of course but uh <clears throat> you, you you gain great great respect from the people that uh, you competed against but more importantly some of the people that you played with you know elgin baylor mm -hmm. i don't think there's a day goes by i don't think about him we don't communicate hardly at all which is sad mm -hmm. uh, but uh as someone i just loved as a person uh, forget his play as a basketball player uh, he, who was he was just an incredible player. There's some people that I played with, and obviously uh, I don't mean to cherry pick names, but uh, there's certainly players that uh, I've had great admiration for. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Jerry, you played during a very volatile era in the '60s um, with civil rights and race issues at the forefront. Um, you made it really clear 
in your book and and interviews I've I've seen that you really empathize with the black players that you played with. Um, you know, they were Jim Crow laws. Players couldn't stay. Black players couldn't stay in the same hotels. You know, it was it was insane what was going on. And now we we we're back in um, this era of social justice and the players speaking out that they have bigger platforms now. Of course, how do you relate to what? you went through and what you saw the league go through in the 60s to what's going on right now? Well, I've seen a lot in my life, <laughs> you know, a lot of things I didn't want to see, uh, things that were embarrassing to me as a white person uh, to watch some of the things that have gone on. I, I just, I don't understand. I, I really don't understand. And I hate to see a police department or uh, uh, anything of service to our country have a have a some kind of a red mark on them uh, you know this is wrong this is wrong that's wrong mm -hmm. there's always a few people that overstep their boundaries okay and i think you can see it now with people who walk around with no mask on uh in an area which is dangerous to people and particularly people my age mm -hmm. uh it's a lack of respect is what bothers me uh, uh, more than anything people are human beings Mm -hmm. We all should be treated alike. Yeah. <clears throat> and during my time, because we didn't travel the same way, we didn't have the same perks that everyone has today. We stayed in hotels that, where <clears throat> you might find after a game where we might be playing three nights in a row on the game, and mm -hmm. we stayed in the same hotel. We'd be playing cards till 4 o'clock in the morning and have a 6 o'clock flight yeah. or a 6 o'clock pickup to go to the airport. And uh, those were times that <clears throat> we spent so much time together. And probably the greatest learning lesson I had about race was w were with my black teammates. Because at that point in time, everyone had to go to school for four years. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you're talking about 22-year-old young men uh, who some of us wet behind the ears. But what they saw was completely different than what I saw. And my empathy toward race has always been there. Uh, everyone should have a right to have some dignity. In this country, uh, there's a lot of people that have been disenfranchised, and they certainly have. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think today, uh, with the prominence of our black athletes and their ability to speak, and because they're so popular, people will listen. <clears throat> and hopefully, this will change the mind of people about how we should treat each other, not only with respect, with, but with, with dignity. Mm -hmm. and respect different cultures my goodness in this city what do we have 90 different people that speak different languages or little communities here and there and I, I think this is one of the things about los angeles that has made it so unique for me because i got a different perspective and seeing being a hillbilly from west virginia <coughs> to come and <coughs> have a chance to experience other things in my life that i never dreamed possible unless i had the ability to play basketball yeah <coughs> Well, Jerry, I um, I reread your book, right? I mean, you know your book, but I'm showing it anyway. Um, and uh, man, it just, you know, the first time I read it, it was fantastic. But rereading it, Jerry, and um, having known you all this time, it just, there's so many things that, that stood out to me. And there are two great autobiographies, probably the two best autobiographies that I've ever read. One is yours, and one is Bruce Springsteen's Born to Run. I don't know if you read Bruce's, but there's, and I'm a huge Bruce fan, but aside from that, there are so many parallels. And for example, both of you came from working class backgrounds, you from West Virginia, him from New Jersey. Um, both of you were raised in difficult father-son relationships um, that affected both of you your whole lives. Um, both, both of you openly discuss your lifelong battles with depression. Um, you were incredibly, both of you obsessed with your crafts, right? You with basketball and him with music. And both of you, you know, quite frankly, have had charmed yet tormented lives, which is the subtitle of your book, right? Um, so I had a long talk with your co-author, Jonathan Coleman, and the book was released in 2011, right? I believe, right? Thanks, and I had asked Jonathan, um, so was this book a catharsis for Jerry? And he said, that he believed that it wasn't a catharsis, but it was a cleansing, that, that you told him that, right? So what did you mean by that, Jerry? I mean, what's the difference? Well, you know, I think uh, a lot of us in life and a lot of people in life almost live um, 
a lie sometimes because it's not really who being an athlete, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> was special to me. You know, people don't look at what formed the person that you become at all. And I know with me, um, I was almost ashamed of any success I had. Uh, that would be hard for people to believe. Um, winning was the only thing that mattered. Uh, I didn't play for myself. I didn't play for adulation. The thing that mattered most to me, honestly, was to win. But you played, I played for the fans <clears throat> and obviously for your teammates. Uh, it was such an awkward, complicated life for me to go when I first came to Los Angeles. Um, and I had a lot of success in college as a player and a lot of, you know, I could have gone to a lot of different schools because of my high school career. But I wanted to go to my state university uh, for whatever reason. I just wanted to go there. And frankly, it's the best thing I've ever done because my connection with West Virginia is still very strong. Uh, as I told Steve, I, I wish I had been able to amass a lot of money because I would have, that would have been the, completely the charity of my choice, even though I've done some things for the university mm -hmm. to try to help <clears throat> kids get an education and mm -hmm. to honor my brother who was killed in Korea. <clears throat> but the awkward part of it is to, even at this point in time, uh, you know, I, I was reading last night and I'm, I'm saying to myself, you know, I wish I would have done something really important in my life, <laughs> something really important. And, and I'm, I'm serious, Andrew, mm. uh, being an athlete was easy. Uh, you know, I was given a gift. I was ultra competitive and even today I'm competitive. But I, I just wish that I could have made an impact on the world in some, some different way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when, I, when you go to bed at night and you start thinking about things like that, you realize there's so much more in this world uh, that is important than just being an athlete. And yet people will, you know, fawn over people. More importantly, they will look at athletes as, as put them on a pedestal. And oftentimes we don't belong on that pedestal. And uh, <clears throat> I think the, the greatest lessons I've learned in my life is giving, being kind to everyone. Um, I don't hate anyone. I mean, I literally don't hate anyone. I had pe I've had people in my life that have been very deceptive uh, that I have not cared for. I don't hate anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wish everyone would adopt an honesty policy when we're dealing with each other instead of in this league you know players talk about each other behind their back uh criticize each other this guy's not that good that guy not that good i just wish everyone would let people be who they are stop i keep hearing this mount rushmore stuff okay uh for basketball players well listen we have a lot of players in this league who have had very good careers, but I look at them and everyone talks about them as the greatest players. Heck, they make the all pro team one time. Mm -hmm. That to me is not a great player. Someone is a great player. You've got to make at least, at least a minimum of eight times. Mm -hmm. That to me would de define a, a truly great player. Yeah. And my def definition of greatness and other people's definition of greatness is far removed from what people celebrate today. Yeah, but uh, I said I've been lucky in my life. Uh, I'm thrilled that I was able to uh, have a career like I had. Uh, disappointed that we didn't win more championships for the city of Los Angeles. As I say, I've had a lot of sadness there with the Lakers, uh, a lot of joy. I guess at the end, a lot of disappointment. Mm. Um, Jerry, you know, I, I got to differ with uh, with what you said because athletes now. I guess maybe in your time it wasn't as, as true, but there are exceptions to that too. But now the athletes have such a voice through their, their platforms and, you know, they can be a hero on the court, which is great. And, you know, we see that with all, all the big stars and all the leagues, but they can really affect social change. They can really affect um, voting. They can, you know, they can bring, bring topics to the forefront that have been left in the shadows. And one of those very importantly is mental health issues. And, you know, Kevin Love has led the way um, in the NBA with that. Um, 
But I, I, I honestly have to say that, that your book, you know, which came out nine years ago, um, and coming from you with your history um, and who you are, I, I, I really give you the credit for leading the way in opening the conversation for mental health of athletes. Quite frankly, I do. And um, I, I know you don't want, ever want to see yourself as a trailblazer or anything like that, but I think that that, that gave athletes of today, um, they, it empowered them to come forward and speak. Well, I, you know, I think we all, I don't know, all, all, if everyone does, because you have so many different people to talk to. I never sought help in my life for my particular problems. And uh, um, I used to say, suffer in silence. And I sort of learned how to deal with it personally. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some days that I'd wake up and, and frankly, I didn't want to wake up. And, you know, when you, when you see uh, the enormous amount of suicides today, and I'm sure this pandemic, people inside not interacting with their friends, um, it's, it's difficult. It's really, really difficult. And for me, there was times, honestly, Andrew, that, that um, I know a couple of times after uh, we lost in championships, uh, I didn't want to be around. And uh, it was a, a horrible, horrible feeling to say someone who was health. Well, I think you always think you're healthy. You don't know that. Mm -hmm. But uh, someone in maybe the physically the prime of their life competing for the biggest prizes and the reject. It was almost like a total rejection. Mm -hmm. And when you reject people and when you only care about yourself <clears throat> and honestly, I see that so much today. Uh, Self-promotion, people uh, lying like like crazy about who they are. Uh, why can't people just be honest about who they are and the problems they face? And I think this would be a better world. We're, we're creating uh, we're creating so much uh, division in this country by people fudging on the truth all the time and. Uh, and not being candid and sometimes sometimes they get by with it and sooner or later i think there's a day in their life when they're when they're going to be older and not as relevant mm -hmm. that maybe they'll look at themselves i wish i hadn't done this i wish i hadn't said that and uh there's so much of, of that that goes on in this world but in the sports world where there's so many different uh personalities involved uh where there's so many <coughs> people who want to be relevant uh some of them embellish who they really are but as you mentioned the players have an enormous platform to help make a change and i think anything related to uh mental health uh, emotional stability uh, probably the worst thing in the world i think when you have this uh, problem uh with <clears throat> with yourself and the person you talk to all the time is, is you. You don't talk to anyone else unless you seek help. It's just a god awful feeling to have <clears throat> looked at yourself and have no self worth at all, regardless of what you've accomplished. And you know, I, I think today you see so many, and I see these very accomplished people in sports and 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 uh, people who are writers, creative, really smart people. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you know, look, you look, and they're gone by their own doing and it's so sad to uh, to see people who are so gifted and so talented leave much too early yeah it's true and um there is help out there and, and we're finding out now you know more and more that athletes are speaking up i don't know if you saw the documentary that just came out on hbo called the, the weight of gold have you seen that um Really fantastic documentary. Repeat that again, the greatest. Oh, the weight of gold. It's it's Olympic athletes like like Michael Phelps, Lolo Jones, Apollo Ono, Sasha Cohen, talking about the very issues you wrote about in your book that we're talking about right now. Depression. Um, you know, Olympic athletes they compete. You know, it's forty five seconds, and that's going to determine their entire life. <laughs> you know, um, all the financial hardships they went through, uh, how they define themselves. Excellent documentary, and I totally recommend that. Well, I will. I will look at it because you know, you know, there's one one thing I'm, I'm you can talk about too. I think that would probably weigh heavily, and and those people who you're talking about, the Olympic people, mm -hmm. individual sports. Okay. If you think of all the hard work you put in an individual sport and you lose, 
Yeah. And maybe you just didn't have, maybe you were the, maybe you were the best. You've proven you're the best a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And you had one day when you just didn't quite have it. You think of all the training that they went through, all the trauma they went through to get where they are. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden an individual sport would put more pressure on someone who's depressed in a team sport, because in a team sport, other people are supposed to, con are supposed to contribute to winning. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, the onus on winning is one or two guys. They'll carry those people along like a pack horse, mm -hmm. and um, they'll make them win. But uh, it's it's great when you win. There's an elation that's hard to even describe. Winning a gold medal on a team mm -hmm. is the greatest thrill of my life. Better than winning a championship or being involved with other championship teams. Mm -hmm. um, it's the greatest lesson of my uh, of my life too, as an amateur to win a gold medal. Yeah. Uh, it never, never crossed my mind when I was growing up that I would have a chance to represent our country. And obviously uh, having a brother killed in Korea during the war has made me probably uh, very much of a fan of the military and what they do, put their lives in danger every day when if there's combat and you go home a day and you're, brother or a loved one is in a service and you get a no notice from the uh from the authorities that they're gone mm. um i'll never forget that day it's probably the rawest day of my life mm -hmm. uh, yeah i can remember distinctly everything I, that day i was 13 years old <clears throat> i can remember distinctly exactly what i did all day mm. mm -hmm. all day and um life-changing moment for me probably the thing that made me from being because of what i saw in my house um to be kind of a confrontational kid even though i was really little mm. uh, to being like a completely someone who wouldn't talk or wouldn't interact with anyone do you think that your your really incredible competitive spirit was um fueled by the loss of your brother, like you, you, you talk about it in the book, and I can't really express what you said, but um, you talk about throughout the book how your brother's, um, the loss of your brother stayed with you your whole life and drove you, right? But it drove you like to the nth degree. And um, did that competitiveness start before his death or it came afterwards? Well, you know, some Andrew, I've always been ultra competitive, and frankly, it's almost ridiculous. It, 82 years of age, I'm still that way. I don't like to lose, um, uh, but I, I think you have to learn how to lose, but you also have to learn how to win. And um, as I say, I, I don't think that did it for me, but it just changed me as a person completely. And mm. uh, mm. I, beside my bed, every once in a while, I have a bunch of letters my brother wrote from the Korean War in the, what, 43, 1943, 1942. Mm. They were passed along to me, and um, obviously there wasn't much time to write because they were in combat. He was, they, they were in Seoul, and I think they got driven out of Seoul two or three different times. And he was deeply religious. And uh, <clears throat> just reading these simple little letters, they might not be more than, more than two paragraphs because he didn't have time. Mm. <clears throat> and that's how simply they were written but it's almost like he wanted to say hello to everyone. And uh, I will, when I'm in one of my dark moods, mm. I'll go pick that, those up and read them and uh, probably shouldn't even read them because it makes it even worse anymore. But um, mm. it's something that I've embraced. Uh, his death uh, will never understand why someone as deeply religious as him mm -hmm. could, get, uh, could get killed and my question of my question of faith has always been shaken by by that incident, and uh, mm. as a lot of people, I'm sure. Mm. So, Jerry, when uh, when Kobe died so suddenly with his daughter and all those people on the helicopter in January, I mean, it had to be had to bring that back to you, right? I mean, it's, it was such a shock for all of us and all of us who knew him and loved him as much as you did. Um, I mean, it just, to this day, six months later, I just still can't process it. I'm sitting here in front of me, 
probably 50 pictures of Kobe up on my walls because I have to constantly be looking at him all the time. And I talk to him sometimes, <laughs> honestly. Um, and thank God we have our book together that we did that kind of is the thread now, you know, for, for the millions and millions of fans out there. Um, you know, I, I watched some of the interviews you did after the tragedy. Um, you know, I know how much he meant to you. Um, <laughs> I, I don't even really know what I'm going to ask you, but uh, how are you dealing with that now? I mean, it's it's still raw. It's still a shock. Um, well, um, good question, Andrew. Um, you know, I think you come to have to come to grips with things, okay? <clears throat> you know, the finality is something is there. And when I, um, you know, when I think back to that day, I'm sitting here on a Sunday morning reading the newspaper, um, as I always do, because I love to read. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm watching, so I get a call and said, somebody said there's a helicopter crash. And all of a sudden, they suspect that it might have been Kobe on the plane with other mm -hmm. people. And the first thing you do, you you start to worry, okay? Please, this can't happen to him, okay? He's got too much of a life to give. His, uh, uh, you know, his career afterwards was going to be bigger than, than it was as an athlete. And I think the suddenness of it and his age, but more importantly, the daughter, and let's not forget the other people. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It just was gut wrenching to me to think that they'd been taken, and um, I'll never forget. And obviously, you took the pictures uh, of some of the times I saw him sitting into game with his daughter uh, Gianna on the floor, and to see the joy, uh, to see the love between those two, it was just amazing. Mm -hmm. And I know this is a terrible thing to say, but people. Uh, when you have kids, you try never to make a difference. Uh, but I think there was a different connection there with him and her. Mm. And um, mm -hmm. as I say, he, you know, his legacy will never be forgotten. You know, and what it was about taking his daughter to compete. Yeah. And that's who he was. He was the ultimate competitor with the ultimate skill. And playing in a city, Los Angeles, obviously made his legend bigger. It just resonated he resonated with so many people because basketball is a worldwide game okay mm -hmm. and the importance as you mentioned of athletes um, of his caliber and there's not many of his caliber let's face it there's not mm -hmm. and um, you know he just it was just gut-wrenching and we have obviously some pictures here with him and my kids. And, uh, yeah. and, you know, when I look at them, I say, Oh my God, look how long, young he was. And look, mm. look how young my kids were. And, um, those are the constant reminders and that I have. And, mm. you know, you'll see a basketball game, you'll see a play and mm, it's say, mm, uh, that's something that looked like something that, that Kobe would have done because you know, people in this league, if their ability allows them to do it, will copy other players. And unless you have that kind of skill, you're not going to be able to copy him. But uh, it was, I think for, in our house for probably two weeks, it was really quiet, really quiet. And yeah. it couldn't go by uh, something uh, that didn't remind you of him. And a constant reminder on TV, they just, <clears throat> They wouldn't let it rest, it, and it, it almost made me mad that because it seemed like it was becoming a, a coming becoming a commercial reality. Instead of letting his family grieve mm -hmm. and uh, uh, just not put it out there every day, but honestly, it started to make me mad. Uh, mad that he was gone, but mad that people would try to take advantage of, of someone's death to make money off of it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, Jerry, when, when Kobe decided to retire, 20 years, amazing career, right? Um, I mean, you drafted him, <laughs> you traded for him in the draft, and you knew him as a, as a youngster, and uh, everything you just described about becoming, you know, this 
Wiley veteran, father, multi, you know, um, championships, MVPs. Um, it was a little bit, to me, a little reminiscent of when you decided to retire in uh, 74, right? I mean, you probably could have played some more, right? I mean, I know physically. Oh, for sure right? I could have played. Yeah. For sure and, I could have played. and he could have too. I mean, did he call you? Did you guys talk about it before he announced it? No, we hadn't. I, you know, I hadn't, um, because I was involved with someone else, I, I never have tried to remain in contact with players, okay? I just haven't. Because I don't think it's my uh, idea. First of all, people, you know, if you say something nice about a player today, and what what derogatory thing was I going to say about him? Now, if I if I came out and said he was a bum or this or that, then I probably wouldn't have got fined. But um, as I say, it just it just his time was up. Okay, his time was up. Mm. He could not have played. And that year was a difficult year for him, Andrew, a very difficult year. It wasn't a typical Kobe Bryant year. Mm -hmm. And I think the last game made when he had, I don't know how many points, but he had a ton of points in the last game. Yeah. <laughs> that probably, if he would have come there and laid an egg that, that game, uh, I'm wondering if people would have, you know, the praise that he got from that last game, Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if people will look at it a little bit different, but that wasn't his best, Andrew. That mm -hmm. season was not his best. Mm -hmm. And I think as a player, you know, when you don't want to go on to damage what, what you've accomplished. Mm -hmm. And he, he was smart enough. He was engaged enough in other things. Uh, he was finding other avenues to make himself relevant, but something that I think he really, he really enjoyed doing. Mm. This was one very smart person, mm. one very, very smart person. Mm. But more importantly, he was going to pursue, he was going to pursue something. Some players, athletes, they don't have the opportunity he had, mm -hmm. but more importantly, they don't have the drive that he had <clears throat> to be able to, <clears throat> to have a vision to do something. And he was not only able to do it, but he associated himself with people that could lead him in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, it was a sad day, and a going uh, going to the uh, memorial <clears throat> was a very interesting day. Okay, very interesting day because and you see a lot of people there that you sort of <clears throat> that are obviously fans, and uh, and uh, the tribute was paid to him was remarkable. Mm -hmm. But um, as I say, his legacy will live forever. Uh, it was just a horrible day in the West household. <clears throat> yeah, I, I can imagine, as it was in mine and millions of others. Um, you know, Kobe had a famous saying, Jerry, and you've probably heard it, that if you're not obsessed with what you do, we don't speak the same language. <laughs> and I, I, I think it's safe to say that you guys spoke the same language, you know, and then some, because I'm sure you saw the edge in him that you had, um, the drive, the competitiveness. Um, you, know, you talk so eloquently in, in the book about that you felt like you were a surrogate father to him, that your your son Ryan especially was very close with him um, in those early days. You know, I, I think we're just, we just have to be thankful that he came into our lives. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. And uh, I am. I'm thankful that I was able to be around this guy for 20 years. How amazing was that? Well, you know, as I say, I think all of us who had shared time with him, he found that he was a, he was different. Okay, he wasn't a, he wasn't your typical athlete. Uh, yeah. You know, he um, his skill level obviously was off the chart, and his competitive level was so easy to see. I would tell you this: <clears throat> there's a lot of people that are as competitive as him, a lot, but they didn't have the skill to do it, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and, you know, everyone has a different way of being competitive. You know, he's vocal, uh, you know, Irvin Johnson, very vocal when he played, you know, jumping all over the place. Kobe was, you know, his reactions, Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. But trust me, there's a lot of other guys out there that are hyper competitive mm -hmm. that just don't project it the way he did. And I think that's what captured the imagination. Yeah. Of, forget older people. The ones that matter most are the kids, okay? Yeah, yeah. They're the ones that matter most because that's who drags mama and dad to the game. <laughs> they grow up with somebody like him because the length of his career, they might have been 10 years old and when they started, and all of a sudden, 20 years later, 
they're 30 and they might have kids and they're dragging them to game to see the greatness <laughs> of Kobe Bryant. Yeah, yeah. And this creates fans forever. And certainly the Lakers don't like for fans in Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, Hey, Jerry, I was there in 2008 in Springfield when you um, were part of that roundtable discussion that NBA Entertainment put together for um, Pat Riley's enshrinement, the Hall of Fame. What, what was going through your mind? Were you sitting with all these guys that you were the architect of their championships? I mean, we all know that. What, could you remember back then in 2008 what was going through your mind sitting with these guys and just kibitzing and, and going over you know, some great memories? Well, first of all, uh, Andrew, I hate going to the Hall of Fame. Okay, I almost <laughs> didn't go. Uh, listen, uh, seriously, I almost did yeah. not go. Right. And I was a recipient of it. I, I said, why should I go this? I, I just, again, the attention you get yeah. uh, was way too much and over the top. Mm. And, you know, as I say, somebody said, well, you know, hopefully if Kobe Bryant would have been alive, ho- hopefully he'll get elected. Come on. He was going to get elected, period. Yeah. Okay. Of course. Um, but that was an interesting day because I, I think that I had obviously been part of uh, bringing uh, these players to Los Angeles. And mm-hmm. I think the different thing that you see out of is the, are the ones who uh, are much more vocal, uh, the ones who are quieter. And I've always had my favorites because I've seemed to favor the quieter ones okay to be honest with you um more like more like my personality but i sat there and listened to it and somebody would say something oh my god i almost forgot that right right because you 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 did so much of that and um but at the end of the day sitting there you start looking at these players and you say to yourself oh my gosh hall of fame 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 okay Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so there's a believability when you're talking about things like that but uh, the thing I felt best, obviously, was being around those guys because you don't see them very often. You don't have a chance to have any personal chats. It's never about sports. Mm-hmm. And um, it was pretty thrilling. And obviously, when Pat got in, you know, I remember as a player, he didn't get an ch- opportunity to play as much. And mm-hmm. and uh, he had a, uh, a crazy way of getting involved in coaching the Lakers. And he's yep. had enormous success since then and obviously i'm very proud of him he and i were very close when mm-hmm. particularly when we we're players and mm-hmm. uh that situation always changes when you're a coach and you know and and gm uh, right. uh, it's a little bit more uh balancing act than than uh being a player and a player yeah yeah um uh, yeah you talk about your relationship in the book it's it, it just fantastic and and um to be there you know a, f- a fly on the wall for that conversation just like made my year to be honest with you. I loved it. Um, so Jerry, last thing I want to talk about. Okay. And, and I don't want to call it the last act because I, I, I think you got a lot more to go, but at 79 years old, you took the job with the Clippers, right. As a consultant. Now, a lot of people at 79, Jerry, quite frankly, what you've accomplished and the life that you have would, you know, be on, uh, you know, playing golf every day. Or, you know, hanging That's out at the true. club. I would play, ever play golf. <laughs> yeah. I was with you in Maui that time when, we, when you, went, you went to play golf and I drove the cart, but that was another story. Anyway, um, why did you do it, Jerry? I mean, really, I mean, I, I've heard you talk about it. It was at the press conference, but you never really said, like, why you took that job. Well, first of all, Steve Ballmer, if you're around him, uh, he's infectious, okay? Mm-hmm. He's the most straightforward guy. He doesn't beat around the bush. He's just there, okay? Yeah. And um, I, I'm just too competitive, even to this day, mm. to sit around, okay? I just am too competitive. And obviously, uh, you know, when someone wants you, that feels pretty good, okay? Yeah. They still feel that you haven't, uh, that you have something to give. And obviously, I wasn't one of some other places, okay? So it was just a good feeling. And I work with a lot of basketball people, a lot. Mm-hmm. And my preference is to work with basketball people instead of people that don't have any basketball experience except watching films and going to games and everything who get involved with teams. And this place has got a lot of basketball people there. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the most formal teams in basketball. Mm-hmm. It is by far. Uh, I, I wouldn't trade our top 10 guys for any team in the league, not one. 
Mm -hmm. And I just think we're that deep. If we could just ever have a healthy mm -hmm. group of people or people together, I've never seen anything like it this year. Mm -hmm. But I do think we're very capable. Uh, some of the things that have been done there in a short period of time uh, are pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. And there are probably five years left here for this team to be really good mm -hmm. uh, because all these players are going to be in their prime. And when I look at other teams aging, of players, look at the age of players. Uh, we should be here for a while in Los Angeles. And hopefully we'll uh, have an opportunity again, as we mentioned, uh, how fun would it be for the Clippers and Lakers to play, okay? Uh, would it be for bragging rights to the city? It might be bragging rights for a season mm. if the Clippers would win, but mm. the Lakers' history and the people they've had playing here, mm. uh, that's never gonna go away. But from now on, uh, when they have a new building here, mm -hmm. they're going to have their own group of fans. They're going to be completely different than Laker fans. And that's why I think what makes life so interesting, okay? Mm -hmm. I really do. It's all about competition. And let's hope the best team wins. And I think we have the best team. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I, I can't wait to get down there and see all these teams, especially the two L.A. teams. And uh, like I said earlier, God willing, they'll go head-to-head -head you know, it won't be a hallway series um, like we had hoped at Staples Center, but I think these guys would play against each other anywhere, you know, <laughs> at a playground or YFCA. Well, this, it doesn't you know matter. This is really an awkward, <laughs> unique time. It really is. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how, um, as I say, there's something about the day of the game. Yeah. How do these players in their own mind, uh, and this is a remarkable part about these players, adapt themselves from uh, being uh, – uh, you know, preparing themselves to be there before a lot of people and all of a sudden they're by themselves and <clears throat> somewhere along the way you have to, even though you respect other players, you've got to find a way to dislike them for 48 minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You seem to have that down pat when you were playing. <laughs> well, I didn't like anyone I played against. I don't care who they were. Yeah. <laughs> I, hate, I hated them all. Yeah. Well, I don't hate, I hate them all. I just, didn't like him that day. And you got the nine, what, nine broken noses to show for it? <laughs> well, more than that, yeah, nine broken noses. There's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of internal things that will be worse than the broken noses. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> well, Jerry, just want to, I want to thank you again. I mean, this fantastic conversation. I've known you for so long. And um, in the intro to this, and I'm going to send it to you when it comes out, but I'm going to recant the first time. Well, I'm going to tell it actually right now, if you have a second. The first time I met you, you're not going to remember this. I'm sure you won't, but it was the... You had a lot more hair then. I had a lot more hair. I had a, I had a disco mustache going, you know. Yeah, that's right. And um, I was sent by the NBA to get a, a photo of Jerry West in his office at the Forum, right? This is like 1985 or six. Oh, Here, I'm this young photographer. I'm... And this is... My dad had the perfect expression, I am sweating bullets, okay? Because, like, you, you had this aura about you. I, I had never talked to you. We, you know, had never interacted. And all of a sudden, I got to go up there. And I go, and I, I'll remember this like it was yesterday. And Mary Lou greets me at the door. And she looks at me like, don't screw this up. <laughs> it just, you didn't say it, but I just felt it. And thank God you were on the phone when I went in your office. And you remember it was that paneled office and everything. And we'll show the picture. Um, and it gave me a few minutes to set up lights and stuff. And <clears throat> I thought you were going to get me out of there in like two seconds. But you couldn't have been more gracious. Because I think you sensed this like fear that was coming at me. <laughs> and I, I was a pretty self-confident guy back then, you know. But um, I'll never be able to thank you enough for that. And um, I, it, it was one of those moments in my career that I'll, I'll always remember. It, it empowered me, quite frankly, and uh, it gave me a lot of confidence. And our relationship, you know, has been great ever since when I stopped being afraid of you. <laughs> well, Andrew, you know, <clears throat> other than the players, you're probably the well -known, uh, best known man in the league, okay, <laughs> other than the players. But uh, as I say, wow, that's a high a compliment coming from you. Remarkable run. And um, I think the, the one thing, uh, again, I've always try, tried to do, I have never, to my knowledge, mistreated anyone. Uh, I've had some <clears throat> conversations with writers that were not very much fun sometimes because 
uh, some of their commercial opinions about <laughs> what they think is right and what they think is wrong. Right. And uh, but no, I I try to treat everyone nice, and it's just yeah. just part of who I am, part of where I came from, mm. and I will never, <clears throat> I will never ever change that. It's not going to ever happen. No, I I've seen you, and there's you know fantastic story in the book about how you and Lee Moore were friends. And, and, you know, no one, no one in the world knows who Lee Moore is, except in your book and people like me and John Black and people who saw him every day. But, you know, you just had this knack, you still do have this knack of just being so approachable in a way that, that just disarms people, I think. It's just because they know they can't imagine. I mean, here, you know, I'm going to call you the logo. I know you hate that, but, you know, people... I mean, this is the logo that you can't, you know, how do you, how do you approach him? But once people, you know, approach you, you are, you know, just the friendliest guy out there. I, it's just amazing to me. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate Andrew, but um, there's a right way and a wrong way to treat people. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, I think this world would be better if we would be more civil, try to help people yeah. uh accomplish what they want to accomplish more importantly help people do their jobs and mm -hmm. you know i always read today you know we've got leaks in this organization we've got leaks in this organization <laughs> i think it's despicable for me to hear that and let me tell you why because the agents are the ones who constantly mm -hmm. uh, are putting these rumors out there and then there's one person in our league it has might might as well be sitting in everyone's office and that's uh <laughs> <laughs> that's Woj and uh, yeah. Adrian Wojnarowski, and uh, who's a wonderful guy, and he announces a trade before it's even made. Okay, so he is in close contact with all the people, mm. agents and GMs, and I have to laugh when I hear these people. Well, it's it, it, this is not the damn CIA. Okay, this is about communicating with people, and some people. Right. Just can't keep your mouth shut to something that's really important. But as I say, this world is ever changing. And I think the thing that makes people uh, who are, I think, who prosper, the, the, the ability to mm -hmm. be able to, uh, to adjust to, to the things going on in this world. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. So, Jerry, what, one very last thing. So, Mazel Tov to you and Karen, your family, for Johnny okay. and, and Michelle for the baby, um, little McKenna. Have you been able to see McKenna since she was born? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. All right, good. I just, saw his mom, I just saw his mommy on TV this morning talking about men's golf. So. I know she's back doing golf commentary. That's fantastic. So here's the question. Knowing how competitive you are, and she is a world-class golfer, you know, one of the greatest of all time, men or women, do you get on, out on the links with her and compete with her? <laughs> and how does that go if you do? Well, Andrew, at one time I could have competed with her, okay? I could <laughs> Yeah. But she is just, she's a unique talent. She's been hurt so much in her career, which has mm -hmm. been detrimental to her winning more. But uh, as I say, you couldn't find a nice, nicer person. And mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, they're going to be here in Los Angeles this week. And we're going to uh -huh. go to West Virginia, my, uh, my home state, which um, we're going to go there. I have a house there at the Greenbrier, which is, uh, mm -hmm. we're going to go there for about almost three weeks mm -hmm. and just hang out with a, a lot of my West Virginia buddies and um, be nice to see them. Oh, that's so great, Jerry. And uh, I wish you guys the best. Um, most importantly, just stay healthy and safe, obviously. But uh, when I get to the bubble, somehow I'll, I'll wave to you. <laughs> I don't know how that's going to happen. But... Do that. Well, you always have the best seats in the house, okay? That's true, right? That's, yeah, I always that's say right. that. And they actually pay me to sit there with people behind me are paying god-awful amount of money to sit in those seats. So I don't know how that well, works. You're going to have to – thank God you're not big, okay? You're not, you're not a giant of a man. That helps <laughs> right. a little bit. Yeah, you can see great over to, my – Great to talk to you, Andrew. Thank you so much. Jerry, so great, and send my love to Karen and the rest of the family, please. Okay, thank, thank you for your you time so today. Okay, bye. Continue you. good success. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Well, huge thanks to the legendary Jerry West for taking the time to chat with me back in the summer of 2020. As you can tell from our conversation, Jerry's a very complicated person, but always willing to be honest and speak from his heart. It was an honor to chat with Jerry. 
Our history goes back to my beginnings as a sports photographer, and I will always be grateful for his friendship and for not throwing me out of his office that first time I had to shoot him there. <laughs> Huge thanks to Jerry's wonderful wife, Karen, and to Chris Wallace from the Clippers for helping to make my interview with Jerry happen. Big thanks, as always, to my producer and head researcher, Veronica Ahn. Remember, you can find us on the iHeart app and online, as well as Apple and Spotify and your favorite podcast platform. Keep following us on Instagram at Legends of Sport, our Twitter at Legends underscore of Sport. Our website is legendsofsport.net and our YouTube and TikTok channels, Legends of Sport. My photography can be found on Instagram and Twitter at ADB Photo Inc. We'll be back next week with a new episode. Until then, stay safe and stay well.